is Barb Leach with Virginia Cooperative Extension, and I thought I would show you my little hidey hole. This is under the stairwell that goes up to the upper level, and this is where I overwinter my amaryllis bulbs. And so I've just got them in a flat here. Most people would start these in December and have them, or actually at the end of November, and have them ready for a December bloom or maybe January, but I like to keep mine all winter long and I hold them back as long as I can. And I have them on the floor because it's the coolest place in the basement and it's also the farthest from the hot water heater and the furnace. So you can see these little guys are starting to come up on their own. The bulb itself is showing green as well as a flower bloom coming here. Even this little one is showing a little bit of something coming on. So I can't hold them back any longer. I've got to do something with them or the bulbs will soften and they will really um, be set back. So a little bit later I'm going to pot these up and we'll see what to do with them. Hi folks, Barb Leach with Virginia Cooperative Extension again. So I'm out in the garden. I thought I'd come outside here to my potting bench and see if we could uh, work on these amaryllis plants a little bit. So this is the tray that I um, brought in. As you may recall, I was storing it under my cellar stairs or my basement stairs uh, because it's cool and because it will normally hold them most of the winter. And unlike many people that like to uh, bring their amaryllis in and uh, force them and get them to bloom in the house uh, through the winter months, I like to keep mine and bring them out in the summer and put them right out in the flower garden with my other perennials. Uh, it's always so fun to go down to uh, my cousin's house in Florida and he has them out in the perennial bed just like any other plant. <clears throat> now this guy here is one that I had potted probably a week and a half or so ago and I'm not sure what's going on with it because over here is another one. Uh, I repotted it at the same time. These little wire structures are just the bases of uh, old uh, tomato cages. So he's nice and straight and I've had him uh, out in the sun now for two or three days. I always like to start them in the shade under the deck so they don't sunburn. But if you look at the very base of this one, you'll see that it's got this little red streak here and then again on the underside and they do get some sort of a uh, leaf spot disease that will make streaks in the leaves and I suspect that that is what it is uh, that is making it grow so crooked but what I'm going to try to do is in the corner of my vegetable patch I have got this little hose ring that is a guide to keep my hose from pulling my plants over when I go around the corner with it. So I'm just going to lay that there with the head of it down and see if the sunlight will bring that back up. Uh, these all black pots are just some leftover pots that I had some tomatoes in. My poor pitiful vegetable garden normally is turned in February. Uh, you can see I've got a few greens left in it. I've got some kale. I've got some Swiss chard over here on the left. Uh, this is uh, the tail end of a ground cover. Um, most things were in the garden fairly late so I could really only sow a cover crop here in this corner. And this is crimson clover along with some leftover straw that was my mulch. I uh, string trimmed that off the other day because I need to turn it in. Normally you would want to turn your vegetable garden in in February, but I was sick and that didn't happen. So I have a variety of products here because remember the object is to not go out. And I'm not endorsing any particular brand. I'm trying to use what I've got on hand. So I have this miracle Grow potting mix and this probably is best suited for plants that are going to be uh, in the house. 
I don't know how well you can see that. Um, it's a light, kind of a fluffy, peaty mix. You can see some perlite in there, and it's kind of uh, spongy. So it's, it's a light mix, and I suspect that outdoors it may not hold quite enough water because it's so blasted hot out here. Then I have this raised bed mix, which really isn't a potting soil uh, at all, um, but it might be a little bit better. Um, it is more like ground up bark, um, fine pieces, um, not quite as spongy. You don't see vermiculite or perlite in it. And uh, so that would be a little bit heavier and uh, hold some moisture. You've really got to be careful in pots because it has to drain well. And then I found this old box, a bag that is uh, rock hard, so it's been around in my uh, storeroom for a while. This is potting mix for indoor and outdoor, so I'm going to cut it open and uh, see what it's like. I suspect what we're going to have to do is a combination of the different soils to make up something that will um, both hold the, the amount of moisture that I need it to hold and also, um, you know, really drain well. I was trying to see if I could put the spotlight on here and see this soil a little better, but apparently it's not going to come on in the outdoors. So let me pause for a minute and take a look at these soils. Okay, so I'm out here in a little more sun. I thought maybe you could see a little bit better. Um, so the one in the left-hand side in the back is the raised bed mix. The one over here on the left-hand side, excuse me, on the right-hand side in the back is another unknown kind that I just found in a pail under my workbench. The um, right, lower right is the, uh, excuse me, uh, the front right is the uh, miracle Grow, and then this one over here is that Hypenex bag that I just had to open. And it has the uh, most amount of perlite in it, and seems to be the, the lightest. Um, it's uh, fairly peaty. This is more bark chippy. So I think what I'm going to do, because I want to um, hold a lot of water, uh, but drain well is I think I'm going to just kind of mix these up together and probably do about a half and half ratio with the Hypenex, the uh, one that seems to have the most perlite in it, and some of this bark chip mix. And I suspect what I had in the pail uh, may even be the same as the bark chip mix. It's uh, just a little tiny bit of it, so I'm just going to use it up. So I've just used an old cat litter pan, and uh, yes, it is washed, and mixed these about half and half. So you can see that there uh, is some uh, perlite, the white stuff in there, and there's here's some bark pieces and some little uh, wood chips. So I think that this will be uh, adequate for potting outdoors to get that combination of will it hold enough water or will it be so lightweight physically that the wind blows my pot over every time I turn around. So we're fortunate in that we've got so many brands and so many uh, choices these days. So when you go out and look for your products, you want to ask yourself, is it going to be indoors? Is it going to be outdoors? How am I going to use it? And oftentimes I would use things straight out of the bag and buy the bag according to what I'm doing. But remember, we're staying in place. So let me knock one of these guys out of the pot and let's see what we have. I have yet to figure out a good way to uh, give myself a third hand so you can see what I'm doing as I'm doing it. Um, but anyway, this is my guy knocked out of the pot. So I took the pot over here and I washed it out real good because uh, we want everything as clean uh, as we can. But you can see the uh, roots are not too root bound at the bottom because they're not totally circling. In fact, you see wood chips that were 
the extra drainage in the bottom of the pot originally. Uh, so I'm going to knock all of this dirt off of here and see about getting it repotted with some fresh soil. Uh, real dirt, of course, is a mineral base. It's nothing but ground up rock um, with organic matter. And unfortunately, all of our potting soils are pretty much all organic matter. So that means if you want mineral, um, you know, I wish I had a bag of sand or something to put a little bit with it. Uh, but the mineral content is not there. So that means we have to pay attention to fertilizing our plants during the season because they're not getting everything that they need out of a purely organic soil. Okay, so I've knocked most of the dirt off of uh, this. I put some bark chips down in the bottom of the pot to provide a little extra drainage because sometimes when it rains for three, four days in a row and the plants are sitting on the patio or something, they're holding a lot of water. So you can see this little baby bulb that's trying to come off the parent plant. And I don't see any harm in leaving it for this year. So I'm going to leave it right on there. As you can see, I took off some of the outer layers and a whole bunch of the fine root came off. But you can also see that there's some damaged roots here. So I need to trim these roots and try to get everything down to healthy root system. And I don't want it this long because there's no way that that is going to fit into this pot. So um, let me see if I can uh, use my other hand and trim this up a little bit. Okay, so the, I've got this guy ready to pot up. You can see how short I have cut the roots. They're probably four or five inches long because this pot is probably about six inches deep or so. And remember, I've got some chips in the bottom. Um, for this job, pruning shears kind of mangles little tender roots like this, so I actually just used some kitchen shears, uh, sprayed them down with some rubbing alcohol, and cut off all of those diseased portions. I hope that at least part of what I'm doing is in the viewfinder. I've got this hung up in a telephone holder off of a plant hook off the underside of my deck. So I put a little dirt in the bottom. When you're potting an amaryllis bulb, you want about a third of your bulb to be above the soil line. And I want to leave about an inch uh, below the rim of the pot for the soil line to allow room for plenty of water when I do water them. So remember I'm leaving the baby right on there this time and let him go for another year. So I'm going to move my bulb over to the side just a little bit to give him room to gain some girth size. And you want to firm the bulb enough where it'll stay upright, but you don't want to really mash on it too much and get all of the oxygen out of the soil because the, the roots really do benefit from having some uh, oxygen in the soil. So just firm it a little bit and then shake it out even. So here's my next one, almost ready to pot up. I haven't trimmed the roots. Before I trimmed them, I wanted you to see, this is peppermint stick. And to give you some idea in relation, there's a uh, tidy cat litter box. And you can see there's some really long roots. There's probably 16 inches of root there uh, that I'll need to be trimmed down to about 4 inches or so. So here's my next one, peppermint stick. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about labels. I've been using just old Venetian blinds. And I usually try to write on both sides of them because the sun will uh, really fade them. And... We rotate them throughout the summer, so the same side of the label is not always exposed to the light. I also like to sink my label right down where most of it is out of the light. Now, any indelible pen, this happens to be a Sharpie, but anything that is uh, waterproof and considered a permanent marker uh, will work. It's just that every year you have to uh, refresh it because it does fade so. I've looked around to see if I could find some more of these little... Uh, wire parts off the bottom of a tomato cage and I don't find any more. 
Uh, so we'll have to work on some sort of a stake uh, later on. Although when you start them late like this and put them out in the sun after they've hardened off for a few days in the shade, um, then usually the stem is much shorter and stockier than it would be if I was starting this in the house. This last variety, Sumatra, is um, genetically a much smaller strain. And I had to show you, look how cute he is. They're all the same bulb, but they're, uh, you know, babies that have come off this parent plant. And so I'm going to put them all back together in the same pot because I think there'll be plenty of room for all three of them. Um, but because of the size in the different bulbs, I'll have to kind of pot the biggest one first and then work the other ones in so that they all end up at the same depth when I am done. Okay, so I've got everything potted up. We've got a lot of roots and dead plant parts here in our bucket. So I'm going to go on down here to the compost bin and that'll make wonderful stuff to put in with my little bit of greenery that I've got down in here. And I'll come out later on with a fork and turn all this. I always like to keep some compost going because my vegetable garden is right here and it always needs more and more improvement. So I gave these guys a little bit of water. Um, when you're watering this, of course, you probably realize that the soil will will settle down a little bit. So you want to water them and come back and water them again and just do it several times so that that soil is really saturated. And then I've wanted to look and see what else I might have in the house that would be useful. My friend Rick is really, really good about fertilizing. So he uses a liquid fertilizer, not this brand, but a similar thing. Here's an organic product. Now I really like organic products for out in the garden because they help to improve the soil. And then because I'm a lazy fertilizer, unlike my friend Rick, I like to use Osmocote. Uh, amaryllis bulbs are really heavy feeders. And if you don't keep fertilizing them fairly regularly, the bulbs will actually get smaller every year and then they quit blooming. So I'm going to apply a little bit of that Osmocote to get these guys off to a good start. And then I will supplement it with some sort of a liquid fertilizer when I can get out and get some more. So I've gone ahead and applied the Osmocote. This particular product happens to be 19612. So it's got quite a bit of nitrogen in it. The 6, which, you're, which is your phosphorus, controls bloom, and it doesn't have a very high ratio um, of that. So again, I probably will supplement later in the season. But for right now, you probably can see these little prills, the little granules in the pot, and they're time release. So that'll feed for about three months or so. Um, of course, outdoors, it will uh, dissipate a little faster than in the house. And then the other thing that I found, <clears throat> and again, I'm really trying very hard to use things that I find in my house. I think I purchased this at one of the uh, Old Master Gardener plant sales. It's just a little window box. I've got a, a terracotta one and a plastic one here. So I'm going to just set these guys inside of it so that the wind won't blow them over and um, I will leave them right here on my potting bench which is underneath my deck and that'll give them some shade and some protection from dewy mornings or heaven forbid frost. I would pull them in if I knew there was going to be a frost um, but it will give them a chance to acclimate. In a few days I'll put them over here on the patio under the tree where it's a little bit shady, and then eventually I'll move them out into the full sun. But for right now, we've got a little bit more added to our compost. We've cleaned up our mess. Uh, we've got some plants started, and next project will probably be turning this vegetable garden. And that's going to take some manpower. By the way, there's my little skinny red bud down at the end of the lot. 